Johnny Dollar. Tell me, old boy, how's the weather? Cold, wet, and miserable, and who are you? Charlie Warren, Johnny, out here in warm, sunny Southern California. Oh, you lucky dog. Ah, uh-huh, don't I know it. I spent too many long, cold winters at the home office there in Hartford not to know it. You're still with Worldwide Mutual? Sure am. Always will be, I guess, unless they try to move me out of this Los Angeles office. Boy, when I think how you must be suffering back there in New England with all that cold and snow and snow. Okay, rain. okay, Charlie, don't rub it in. We can't all be as lucky as you are and just think of all the beauty you're missing. Yeah? Like what? The clean, crisp, invigorating air, the sparkle of the sun on sleet-covered branches, the sound of sleigh bells, rolling fields drifted high with pure white snow. And all that mud and slush you have to <laughs> plow through there in town, and don't tell me otherwise. Okay, you've made your point. I'm feeling even worse than I did before you called. Now, what's on your mind? Any good reason why you shouldn't be out here enjoying the sunshine, the warm breezes, the smell of orange blossoms, the palm trees, and beautiful broads barging around bikinis, and all the other delights of this subtropical paradise, and I want a badge from the Chamber of Commerce? Yes. What? Money. Well, now, that's no problem. Oh, it isn't. Oh, why should it be? Well, the company's going to pay the freight. Provided, of course, you keep that crazy expense account within reasonable bounds for just once in your life. Oh, Charlie, you touched me to the quick. Have I ever done otherwise? Oh, no. I mean, except for an occasional nickel or dime here and there. Or an occasional C-note now and then. Well, after all, Charlie. Well, seriously, Johnny, I need you. I need your help. Are you free to fly out here? I don't know why not. Okay, now, according to my watch, it's a little after 4 p.m. And no. according to the clocks here in the wilds of Connecticut, it's a little after 7. Huh? Oh, yeah, that's right. Now, look, suppose I take a prop job that'll give me time for a little sleep along the way, and I'll see you first thing in the morning. Okay? I'll meet you at the airport. Okay. <laughs> The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer and the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company, Los Angeles office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Cinder Elmer matter. <laughs> Expense account item one, 176.40, taxi to Bradley Field and a plane ticket. It was close to midnight by the time I could get a flight out of Hartford. I don't know why so many people have to travel this time of the year. And it was nearly three by the time my plane in New York took off and headed west. All my plans to sleep along the way went to pot. Not only because of the several stops we had to make, but because of the cute little brunette who occupied the seat next to mine. A real charmer on her way to L.A. for a winter vacation, and did I have any ideas for how she might enjoy herself out there on the coast? Did I have ideas? But after we landed, then she introduced me to the blonde giant who met her there at the airport and took her in tow. Well, who am I to argue with a man who plays right tackle for the L.A. Rams football team? Anyhow, I was sadly lacking in sleep when Charlie Warren finally found me at the luggage stand, picked up my bags, and led me out to a car parked at the curb. Oh, here you are, Johnny. I'll just toss these bags in the back. Hey, here, Johnny, here's the keys. To a nice, quiet room with a soft bed in it. Are <laughs> you kidding? To this car. Oh, Charlie, why don't you drive? Well, this is one of those rental jobs. Hmm? Sure, my car's over there in the lot. Oh, and I had him throw in a set of chains. Oh, you mean skid chains? Yeah, up where you're going, you're going to need... In sunny Southern California? Excuse me, let me get my glove compartment and be my guest. You mind telling me just where I'm going and why? Now, here's where we are, see... L.A. International Airport, see it? I'd rather see a comfortable bed, Charlie, yeah. Now, you go north on Sepulveda Boulevard to Manchester, east to Harbor Freeway, turn north, then east on the San Bernardino Freeway. I do, hmm? Yeah. San Bernardino's maybe 65 miles or so. Then you turn north here up into the mountains, see? And there's Crestline. There you are. At least that's where you can get directions to Hillcrest Lodge. 
I can. Oh, boy, I wish I could go along with you. That's the most beautiful country up there this time of year. It really is. 75 or 80 degrees of hot smog down here. And up there at 5,000 feet altitude, it's all covered with snow beauty. Oh, Charlie, you're a dirty dog. What? Over the phone, you give me the Chamber of Commerce pitch to get me away from an eastern winter. And when I get out here... Yeah, but this is different, Johnny. You'll love it. Skiing, tobogganing, magnificent view of all the peaks up there on the rim of the world drive. It's right near Lake Arrowhead, you know. No, I didn't know. And what's more, I don't care. Unless I can get a little sleep, Charlie. I can sleep. Johnny, up there in that clean, clear, crisp, cold air on that high altitude, you'll sleep like you've never slept before. You mean like sometime tonight? Sure. If I'm lucky. What do you mean by that? Well, you still haven't told me what kind of a case I'm supposed to be working on. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Disappearance, Johnny. Name is Bartley Harmon. Bartley Harmon? Uh Uh-huh. He and his wife, Nora. Real good-looking doll, by the way. Mm-hmm. And his business partner, a man by the name of Elmer Wrightson. Yeah. Well, like they always do this time of year, they all went up to Crestline Hillcrest Lodge for a few days. So? Nora phoned me just before I put in that call to you. Seems the poor little shrimp took off. Poor on... little shrimp? Yeah, her old man, Bartley. Oh. Both he and his partner, Elmer Wrightson, stand about five feet three, about 115 pounds ringing wet. Look almost like twins. I see. Go on. Well, not that Nora. Bartley's wife. She's a good five feet eleven. But Johnny boy, I mean good. She's built like an Olympic champion. Blonde, beautiful, and wow. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Now, what happened to Bartley Armand? Well, he took off for a tramp in the snow, and he suddenly and completely disappeared. Oh? Sheriff's Department put out an APB in the whole area, but... Nobody's seen high in the hair of them. Go on. And Johnny, that's San Badu Sheriff's Department. Well, they know their way around out in that country. If they haven't been able to find him, Bartley Harmon is really lost. And with the way it gets cold up in those mountains, well... Anyhow, Sheriff's boys are expecting you. They'll cooperate. Just what is your stake in him, Charlie? Got him insured for 200000 mm. Accidental death, double indemnity. He's fallen off a rock and busted his neck or into a chasm or something. Now, Charlie... And on top of everything else, heart isn't too awfully good either. Of course, if somebody... Well, you know what I mean. No, I'm not sure I do. Does the Bartley Harmon have a lot of enemies? Mm, Not that I know of. For that matter, I don't think he has any real friends either. Tell me, who would benefit by his death? Well, of course, the business will all go to his partner, Elmer Wrightson. Mm-hmm. How do they get along? Only because they have to, I guess. Keep the business going. I see. And the insurance goes to his wife? All goes to Nora. And how do they get along? Well, she's a beautiful dame. He has a lot of money, and, well, she's a lot younger than he is, you know. No, I didn't know. Now, wait a minute, Johnny. Somebody did murder him. Well, you mean... You think that maybe... You think that maybe one of them... Charlie, I think I'd better get on up to Crestline. Here's a friendly and important reminder from your postmaster. This is the time of year when the post office handles its biggest volume of mail. The extra load often takes extra time. So if you want your cards and packages to arrive at their destination before Christmas... Mail early and often. Make sure addresses are clear and correct. Use postal zone numbers and send your cards by first-class mail. For a merrier Christmas, shop early, mail early. That long, hot drive through the valley to San Bernardino, San Berdu as the natives call it, almost did me in. I really felt the lack of sleep. But then as I swung up into the mountains, and at the 4,000-foot level had to put on snow chains and turn up the windows, well, it really is beautiful country up there. Not only because of the white, clean snow, but the mountains, the magnificent big pines anchored to the sides of them, and the colorful, picturesque little cottages. At Hillcrest Lodge, I found that a young fellow from the sheriff's office, Roy Turner, was waiting for me. After helping me up to my room with my bags, he got right to the point. 
I can't say that I like this situation, Mr. Dollar. Not a bit. Why, Turner? Call me Roy. All right, call me Johnny. Well, Johnny, simply because of the people involved. Man falls in love with partner's wife and does away with said partner? Not a chance. At least there's no chance you'd give him any kind of a break. I'd bet on it. Why? Because Wrightson is the same kind of homely, pedantic, facts and figures little shrimp as her husband Bartley is. And there's no question but that she's had enough of him. Enough to want to get rid of him, Roy? Well, Harmon's worth a lot of money, I understand. A lot of insurance, too. Yeah, that's true. And she's a much younger, good-looking, athletic... <laughs> well, where do you see her? I'd like to. You will. And don't think for a minute she doesn't make the most of it, of what she has. Johnny, for the few days they spend up here every year, she brings along enough expensive clothes to sink a battleship. In addition to snow and ski and skating outfits, I mean. She has a whole trunk full of shoes alone. Anyhow, we're making sure that she sticks around. Rights in two, for that matter. Roy, if they're all on such lousy terms, why do they come up here together? Only because she likes it so much. So Bartley tags along to keep an eye on her. And Mr. Wrightson? To keep an eye on him, I guess. Mm. I take it you've combed the hills around here pretty well. As thoroughly as we know how. Mm -hmm. What about all those little cabins that I've seen around? Been through them all. Apparently, Harmon headed over toward old Ironside. That's uh, just north of here. Has a sharp face on it where the snow doesn't stick. And beyond it, well, in order to save time, we have a helicopter out there looking over that big valley. Roy. Yes, Johnny? You know, over the years, I've investigated an awful lot of disappearances. Yeah. And you would be surprised at how many people disappear deliberately. Just to get away from things, once and for all. But leave behind that beautiful wife he's so jealous of? And his share of a prosperous business? It is a possibility, though. Isn't it? Well, oh, uh, that may be for me. I told the operator I'd be here. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Where? Okay. Leave it there. Uh, have him go back and pick me up at the port. As I started to say, it is possible, Roy. Not anymore, Johnny. Oh? The copter just found Bartley Harmon out there be beyond old Ironside. Or rather, they found his body. We got to the airport on the edge of San Bredou in less than 20 minutes. The copter was already there and waiting for us. We piled in, took off, and headed back to Crestline, then passed it, then circled the cold gray peak that was called Old Ironside. Beyond it was a long, narrow valley, edged on both sides by a heavy growth of timber, and a hundred yards or so from the tree line, out in the open, there on the cold, dry snow, lay the body of Bartley Harmon. I don't see any mark where you landed this freight, Steve. I didn't try to land, sir. Just took her down low enough to make a positive ID, then got on the horn and reported in. They told me to run back to Purdue and pick you up there. Looks to me as though you may have got down there too close. What, sir? I mean this chopper apparently blew a lot of snow on top of it. Hope it didn't cover any clues. Sorry, right, sir. Clues, Roy. Now find a spot to land us up there ahead of it. Right, sir. I can't help wondering what Harmon was doing way out here and alone. Oh, he and Wrightson believe that old legend about a cave full of gold out in this valley often came to look for it. You know, while his wife was busy skiing or skating or tobogganing. With his bad heart, Roy? Well, actually, it's only a mile or so from the lodge, so I guess he figured it wouldn't be too much for him. Looks like he figured wrong, though, doesn't it? Yeah. Kind of knocks my theories into a cock hat, too. You've given up the idea of murder. Yep. Set us down here anywhere, Steve. Right, sir. And we shall see what we shall see. What we saw down there was more than we'd bargained for. 
The body was that of Bartley Harmon, all right. And there wasn't a mark on it. It looked as though the old boy overextending himself at that high altitude had simply had his heart give out on him. Until we found two things. One, another set of footprints leading to the spot. Much smaller prints that could have been made by a woman's snow boots. And second, beside them there in the snow, a cigarette butt with lipstick on it. Looks to me, Johnny, like this settles it. In spite of her alibi. Nora Harmon. Alibi, Roy? That she was over in Arrowhead Village shopping when he took his little walk out here. Anybody try to check up on it? Yeah, but nothing really definite either way. Well, then that doesn't prove that she did this, Roy, that she or anybody else did anything. You mean because of no marks on the body? That's right. And, Roy, there's something about this whole setup that... I don't know. I'm... I don't know. Let's face it, Johnny. Why'd she say she was in Arrowhead when she was really out here with him? Well, was she? And who else had such a motive? Did Elmer Wrightson have an alibi, too? Asleep in his room all that afternoon? And no reason to doubt him. I wonder. But Johnny, Johnny, the footprints. And more important, this cigarette butt with a lipstick... If a lab test shows it to be the same kind that she uses... Steve. Yes, sir. When you and Mr. Dollar haul the body uh, into San Berdu for the autopsy, have uh, Doc Hanley analyze the lipstick on this cigarette, too. Um, have him do that first. While we take the body in? I want to follow those uh, two sets of footprints back to the lodge. I'll meet you there, Okay. What's the matter, John? Hmm? Oh, nothing, nothing, Roy. It's just that... Well, if we've overlooked something out here... And... Yeah? Like what? No, forget it. Uh, come on, Steve. Let's get the body aboard. Yes, sir. Doc Hanley told me that the lipstick was quite unusual. While he went ahead with the autopsy, I had Steve drive me up to the lodge. A five-dollar tip to a light-fingered bellboy got me one of Nora Harmon's lipsticks out of her room. When I got back and showed it to Hanley, he was certain it was the same as that on the cigarette. As for the result of his autopsy... Beaten to death, Mr. Dollar. Without a single mark on him? There were several intestinal and mesentery perforations, blood in the peritoneal cavity. So... He saw no external bruises because death occurred so quickly, the blood stopped circulating immediately. Mm. And without circulation, there can be no hemorrhage into the tissues. Well, that's little known fact, my boy. I see. So it looks then as though Roy may have been right in spite of this hunch of mine. Hunch? In this modern day and age, don't be ridiculous, my boy. Look at the facts. She not only had the motive, but if I understand correctly, is physically capable of such an action. And with the cigarette butt as proof that she was out there with him, well, I'll phone Roy Turner at the lodge and tell him to charge her with murder. I wonder, though. Wonder? Why? What's there to wonder about? Well, Doc, unless she is pretty stupid. Well, I'm certain from what I've heard about her that she isn't. Far from it. Then why leave such obvious incriminating tracks, both the footprints and the cigarette? My boy, even the cleverest of criminals sometimes overlook little things like that. Little things? Doc, this is more like leaving a couple of neon signs. I'd better get back to the lodge. To assist Roy with the arrest? Maybe to keep him from arresting the wrong person. <laughs> into my room at the lodge. Roy was just hanging up the phone. Okay. Okay, Doc. Well, that's good enough for me. I'll, um... I'll bring her in right away. Roy, before you do that... Yeah, I know, Johnny. The doc told me what you said to him. And I agree with you. It was pretty foolish for her to leave such obvious signposts. Not at all like her. Okay, then. But following up uh, those sets of tracks out there really clinched it. How do you mean? Oh, he went for his little walk in the snow alone, all right, but she followed him. And every time he stopped to rest, she also stopped. 
but a couple of hundred yards behind him and well hidden by the trees. And more important, Johnny, yeah. every time she stopped, she lit up and smoked one of those cigarettes, and they are the same brand she uses. I've checked on it. Then when he took off again, she dropped the butt in the snow and followed him again. Until finally, when she had him far enough away to be safe, bango. Now, wait a minute. One other little thing, too, Johnny. Roy. While you were down there in San Berdu, I compared those footprints with a pair of Nora's shoes. Same type and size. Wait a minute, would you? Well? Roy, it has finally got through this thick skull of mine. The butt. The cigarette butt we found by the body. Before you picked it up. Yeah, what about it, Johnny? Listen, did you find some more out there? Several, just further proof. Did you leave any of them laying around out there? Well, sure, one or two are all I need for evidence. All right, come on, we're going out there and look at them. What? Yes, unless you can visualize exactly what that first one looked like lying there beside the body. Well, I don't know. Because I can. And, Roy, before you do anything foolish like arresting Nora Harmon, you better have a look at some of those others. Now, come on. Stopped is just ahead. Good. Glad it hasn't snowed for a while. But I still think this is a kind of silly waste of time, Johnny. And I tell you that both of us ought to be shot for not having been more observant. You still haven't told me what this miraculous inspiration is that... Oh, uh, here we are. And you see? That butt lying there with that same lipstick on. Here, I'll take it along. No, don't touch it. Huh? Just take a good look at it, Roy. Don't you see... It wasn't crushed out. It was simply dropped there on top of the snow. Well, sure, so what? Then what put it out? Well, the snow, what else? Did it? What do you mean? If that cigarette was still burning when it was dropped here on the snow, don't you see, Roy, don't you see? It would have melted some of the snow while it was going out. Wait a minute, Johnny. You're right. Of course I am. All those butts you found were smoked and put out somewhere else. No doubt by Nora Harmon because of the lipstick. Then somebody else carefully picked them up and saved them. And for only one reason, Roy, to plant them out here beside these footprints. Wrightson? Right. Elmer Wrightson, the only other person with a motive. But the footprints from her shoes. Didn't you say that she's a big girl and that Elmer is a little shrimp? Yeah. And if he wears a snow boot like hers, we've got him. But if he doesn't, Johnny? Didn't you also say that she has a whole trunk full with her? Yeah. Well, wouldn't you have at least a couple of pairs of snow boots? Sure, I've seen them myself. Any reason, then, why he couldn't have borrowed a pair of hers and then put them back? Yeah, but if he didn't, Johnny... Well, let's try it, Roy. Let's try the Cinderella bit on him, hmm? Only it'll be, uh, Cinder Elmer. <laughs> we'll make him put on a pair of her snow boots, and if they fit... Well, are you game to try it? Nothing to lose, Johnny. Let's go. Her snow boots fit him all right. And little old Cinder Elmer. Oh, the dumb jerk should have known better. He should have made us come up with some really concrete evidence. But luckily for us, Elmer just broke down and confessed to the whole bit. So, once again, it's up to the courts. Expense count total, including the trip home... Three seventy-seven eighty. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, one of the cleverest cover-ups for a fire bug I've ever seen. And believe me, I've seen plenty. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Cliff Carpenter as Sheriff Roy Turner, Eugene Francis as Charles Warren, Bob Dryden as Dr. Hanley, 
and Jim Stevens is the helicopter pilot. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Stuart Metz speaking. Enjoy the Gary Moore Show weekdays on the CBS Radio Network. At Rule 59 on your Tri-Cities dial, this is WROW Music in Albany, New York. A new summer in town can feel mighty lonesome. Welcome Wagon hostesses make these newcomers feel wanted when they make their cordial welcome wagon visits. Their baskets contain useful gifts from civic-minded businessmen. Invitations to participate in varied social and volunteer activities of the many civic agencies in the community. In addition, every welcome wagon call recipient in the greater Albany or Schenectady areas, as well as Del Mar, Latham, or Scotia, is invited to attend the local welcome wagon club. This is an organization of newcomers all anxious to make friends. Various welcome wagon clubs vary from 30 to 150 members who meet monthly. Their interests include bowling, golf, cards, handcraft, and dancing. You can help to make your new neighbor feel at home. Call State 59640 today and make your neighbor eligible for the many opportunities in a welcome wagon club. Remember, State 59640.